If you've been sleeping for the last week, you have missed one of the best hip hop beefs of all time. Kendrick and Drake have gone head to head, back to back. They have each dropped like three, four diss tracks in a week. They've given us like an album's worth of just straight diss songs. We have never seen Kendrick Lamar this active in hip hop. And we have never seen Drake be scrutinized so heavily in the public eye. History was definitely made. And in this video, we're going to break down each and every diss track. We're going to dissect this entire beef. And there's definitely a clear winner, but I don't think it's for the reasons you guys might think. So we're going to touch on everything. No diddy. But before we do, I just need to address this one thing. I've been hearing a lot of people say that J. Cole made the right move by apologizing and backing out of this beef and that he's the real winner in all this just because of how dark and messy this whole beef has gotten. And no, I highly disagree. You can't walk that back. J. Cole made a potentially career threatening decision by apologizing and showing the world that he was not capable or didn't have the capacity to stand up for himself and defend his own legacy in this whole beef when his name was come into question by Kendrick as well. And what makes it even worse is if J. Cole was a part of this beef, this wouldn't just be a 1v1. This would be J. Cole and Drake versus Kendrick. He would have a rapper just as powerful, almost as skilled, right by his side to take on Kendrick. From a human level, I understand if you didn't want this whole beef and what comes with it on your conscience. I understand that. But from a legacy perspective, in terms of what this means for your career, I don't think we can be dubbing J. Cole the winner in all this just because he backed out early. I think no matter how amazing his music is going forward, all the bars he's been giving us about how great he is and how no one can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against him, all that is meaningless. And I still think no matter how much you guys want to say Kendrick is destroying Drake, J. Cole is the real loser in this whole thing. Now, I have a problem with a lot of hip-hop today right? Because I've been saying again, this on the clock stuff to me isn't as relevant as the quality of the diss tracks, right? You can drop a diss track against your opponent once a month. And as long as the bars are there, as long as you're dissecting their character, as long as it's a clever song, you can still have the upper hand. It doesn't matter how long you take. It matters the quality of what you're saying. And once Drake dropped pushups, everyone was on Kendrick. Academics was posting every single day, documenting how long it took for Kendrick to respond. And I guess in 2024, everyone's attention spans are short. We've made this beef about who can reply faster. And Kendrick has obviously been in tune with that and has heard that that's kind of the public sentiment and he's playing the game he's dropped three records in a day every time drake drops something kendrick drops another track and each one of them is taking different angles now we're going to break down every single song that both drake and kendrick have released so far the allegations they made against each other the character assassinations that both parties have committed but if anyone's telling you that drake has been rapping at a higher level in this whole thing or has been putting out the better music you're wrong you're just wrong it's objective and i said this before everyone said i was glazing kendrick but it was obvious from the beginning right when kendrick dropped like that you can tell he was ready for this. He was ready for this beef. You can't come with that type of energy like he did on like that and not want the smoke, right? Like it was very obvious that he was taking direct shots at Drake and making it very known that he wants Drake to come out, diss him again so he can just go off on him. And I don't even think we're halfway done this whole beef. Like I think Kendrick has so much more to say. That's not to discredit Drake. I mean, I think Drake has, you know, put out some solid work in this whole thing. I think that Drake, you know, won't let up. He's going to respond. He's going to say something. But it's like if you had an older brother and you kept trying to hit him and poke at him and that older brother just is bigger than you, stronger than you, and he could just stomp you out with one kick, with one punch. That's what this is. It'd be like if I tried to fight Mike Tyson right now. Like, Mike Tyson stomping me out. No diddy. And it's the same thing here. No matter how hard Drake tries, unless he has a bomb to drop on Kendrick that everyone's like, wow, Drake really just outsmarted him here or like, you know, drop some crazy info on him and like assassinates Kendrick's character. Unless he could do that, no bar that he raps will be stronger than what Kendrick can come with. And you could see by the amount of songs he's just put out in the last two days that this is so easy for Kendrick to do. Now, another thing I said, which I think puts Drake at a disadvantage, is a couple weeks ago, I said, Drake knows how hard of a target Kendrick is, not only because of how little dirt there is on Kendrick, but mainly because Kendrick is such a strong rapper. So because of that, and because Drake's a chess player, he knows that he had to position this beef where the attention was also centered around him against Future and him against Rick Ross and Metro Boomin and ASAP Rocky in the weekend. Like, he had to paint himself as the underdog. He had to paint it as him being against 20 different guys to make himself seem stronger. Because if he just went at Kendrick, there's only so much he could say about Kendrick. And as you can see, Kendrick can just keep dropping track after track. And it's just, it would be too draining for Drake to try to keep up with that. Instead, he's going at everyone to take your attention away from the fact that what we really want to see is just Kendrick versus Drake. And what this really is, is just Kendrick versus Drake. And I do like the bars he's giving to Rocky and to Rick Ross. Like, I do think that honestly, some of the best bars he's dropped in these diss tracks were against guys like ASAP Rocky. And again, we're going to break these bars down, but just to kind of put everything into perspective, I said a few weeks ago, he's going to paint this as a 20v1. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's trying to distract you from the fact 
that he cannot compete one-to-one -one against Kendrick. And that's a big thing that's holding Drake back right now. Parts are worrying that Kendrick, we don't know if they're true. All these allegations they're making, it just sounds like, like TMZ is reporting. Doesn't sound like rappers rapping. And these bars don't stick enough. And it's not enough of a hit song that this will last. Now, there's a couple things here, right? So firstly, the time clock thing, right? I don't think that should be relevant in this whole thing, but they've made it relevant, right? They're dropping tracks back to back. They're doing it quick. That's what's catching the audience's attention. Another thing is, I don't think that at the core of rap beef, it should be about who has more dirt or who has more to expose about the other person. I think it should be a psychological dissection of their character crafted in the most creative bars possible and not just about reporting, oh, Drake has a kid or, oh, Kendrick, you know, is raising a child that his wife had with another man. I don't think that's what's important in this whole thing. I think it's more about, you know, I'm number one and this is why. And this is why you are not even close to competition for me. And I think Kendrick's doing a better job at that than Drake is. And another big thing is we're in 2024, right? And Drake is number one because of how many hits he has. Drake is known as the best rapper, not just because of how great of a rapper he is, which he is, but it's also because he's dropped hits for the last 15 years. Every single year, he's been on Billboard with number ones, crazy big albums, crazy big singles. So part of this beef, if Kendrick really wants to take that crown from Drake, he does kind of have to play into that game of making diss songs that are also hit songs. This is something I said in another video, that Drake has the advantage of being able to create catchy one-liners, create melodies that are a little more catchy, right? And he's shown you that on songs like Back to Back or Stay Scheming, where he can create diss songs that play in the club, that play in the car, and that you'll just hear everywhere. And that's what makes the diss track even more scathing is that not only are you assassinating your opponent's character but you're also making a song that everyone's gonna be blasting in their car like you're making a song that people can't escape when drake dropped back to back if you were outside that summer it was unavoidable to not hear that song you were hearing that song everywhere so that's another factor in this beef which i think is even bigger than the whole time clock thing or the whole you know who has more dirt on the other person type thing i think really what this is if they're really battling for the crown of who's the best rapper they're gonna have to create songs that people can just be playing non-stop timeless music kendrick has played that angle way better than Drake has here. Kendrick dropped like that which has been number one for weeks. It's getting more streams every single day than push-ups is. And, you know, bars aside, that song is just a better song. It's a bigger hit. It's more catchy. There's more engaging flows. Just a better song. Kendrick did the same thing, in my opinion, with Euphoria. I think Euphoria can be played in a club, not the whole six minutes, obviously, but a good portion of that song can be played in the club and more people would vibe to it than push-ups by Drake. And now he just dropped the biggest banger he's dropped in the entire beef. It's produced by DJ Mustard and it's just a banger front to back. This is like Kendrick's back to back. This is Kendrick's hit him up. This can be played anywhere. This is an absolute smash. And I mean, we'll see by the numbers. Now, obviously, that's not the most relevant factor, right? This is a beef. This isn't about who can get more streams. But at the end of the day, they're not fighting for who's the better rapper. They're fighting for who's the number one rapper in the game. And a big factor that what comes with that title of best rapper in the game, which is why Drake has been regarded as the best rapper in the game, is who has more hits. So that is a factor here. And I think Kendrick knows that because for every song that Kendrick makes where, you know, the beat strip back, it's very calm. He's just kind of going in with his, you know, quadruple entendres and he's really, you know, focusing more on the lyrics. For every song he drops like that, he also drops a banger, like a euphoria, like a like that, like this new song he dropped tonight. So he's dropping both bangers and he's dropping those crazy bar heavy songs. He's playing Drake's game. That has always been Drake's angle is he can make the club hits and then he goes on a five minute song on a boy wanna be where he's just straight rapping. So he's playing Drake's game perfectly. Now where Drake kind of has the upper hand is the fact that on the cover art of Meet the Grams, which was the diss track that Kendrick drop where he's talking to Drake's son and Drake's mom and Drake's alleged daughter. On the cover art of that song is allegedly a picture of Drake's dad's briefcase, which has a prescription for a Zempic, which is a weight loss pill. It has Maybach gloves. It has a couple other things. But what Kendrick is basically implying is that Drake has bugs in his camp. He has people in his organization who are leaking that information, leaking those pictures to Kendrick. Really what that apparently is, is someone from Drake's team had sent those pictures to Kendrick's team, pretending to leak them, but really came from Drake. And you could see that on the t-shirt on the cover. It says short T. And the whole time in this beef, Drake has been making fun of Kendrick for being short. So that would be a pretty clever chess move if it's true where, you know, Kendrick thinks that he's getting all this leaked information from Drake's camp, but really it's just Drake feeding him false information. Now, again, I think one of the biggest problems with the battle they had where they were both dropping a bunch of tracks against each other is that all they were doing was trying to expose one another for information that we don't even know if it's true or not. Drake was saying that Kendrick is abusive to his wife. Then Kendrick dropped a record where he's saying that Drake is hiding a daughter. Unless there's factual proof on any of this stuff, there's no substance to what these two guys are saying on these tracks, right? 
because if you're just spreading lies about one another, it's not entertaining, it's not scathing, because it's lies, and that won't help you win this war long term. In my opinion, and obviously I guess this is subjective, so I could be right or wrong, but what I think will win this war, what will determine a clear winner in this whole thing, is who can dissect whose character in a more creative way. Who can prove that they are the number one rapper in the game by A, dropping songs that are actual hits that actually resonate with the people for, you know, months and years to come, and who can come with the more creative moves. I don't think it's about who can draw faster. I don't think it's about who has more tea on the other person. Again, I really think it's about who can dissect whose character from a psychoanalytic perspective in a stronger, hard-hitting way where it really shifts public perception of that person. At the same time, if you can create a hit song in the process while dissing that other person, then I think you have the upper hand there as well because they're fighting for top rapper in the game. The top rapper needs to be dropping hits that resonate with the people. Now, I recorded a whole separate video breaking down Kendrick's Euphoria this but in the process both of them dropped a combined total of like six different songs against each other so there's a lot to break down here bear with me we're gonna break down each and every bar from these two rappers and I'm going to let you guys know who the clear winner is here. So Kendrick comes at Drake initially kind of questioning his race. And a lot of people were kind of criticizing Kendrick for that because Drake is obviously African-American, right? Drake obviously has a black father. Drake is obviously objectively an African-American or African-Canadian. But on a deeper level, what Kendrick was really saying here is that you appropriate hip hop culture. You appropriate African-American culture. You steal the sounds from different rappers, whether it's from rappers in Atlanta, whether it's from guys like Wayne or Kanye, like Drake's whole career, a big criticism has been that he has used other people's sound to create his own hits. Even with the dancehall stuff or the Afrobeats music that he's made, he's leveraged a lot of other black artists to make hits. And he's put on these different accents, like his Jamaican accent or his Toronto accent. He's kind of like a chameleon and he's using these different cultures to create hits for himself. So I think on a deeper level, Kedrick wasn't insulting Drake for being biracial. I think he was insulting Drake for, you know, starting off growing up as a Jewish kid in a Jewish neighborhood at a Jewish school, which Drake is on record to state that he, you know, did grow up like that. He had a bar mitzvah. He was, he grew up with his white Jewish mother in a white Jewish suburb and all of a sudden has adopted this, you know, mob boss persona and has made made music talking about getting people whacked, putting money on your head, and whatever, whatever. So on a deeper level, I really think Kendrick was coming at Drake for being an outsider of the culture from an upbringing perspective, but acting as though he is something that he's not. And that's been a whole theme with all these songs is that Drake is just a liar. Whether it's Drake is lying about what he's saying that Kendrick has done in his diss songs, whether it's Drake lying about who he actually is as a person, whether it's Drake lying about the accents he puts on in his music and the things that he talks about in his music. He's calling Drake a flat out liar. Now, Drake spin this in a creative way because he came back at Kendrick saying, you know, you're insulting me for not being quote unquote black enough or not, you know, you know, being biracial, basically. But you're married to a biracial woman. So you're coming at me for things that are very close to your family, which is hypocritical. Then Drake goes on to insinuate that Kendrick's manager, Dave Free, had an affair with Kendrick's wife. And they now have a child that Kendrick is raised as his own. Again, there's no proof on this. But if it is true, it's a pretty good angle that Drake could take. So they say not only are you insulting me for being half white, you're married to a woman who's half white. Not only are you insulting me for my relationships with different women that I've had in the past, but you're with a woman who shares the same racial identity as I do. And you're insulting my relationships when you're in an even weirder predicament in your relationship where you're raising the child of another man. Drake then goes on to imply that Kendrick has been abusive to his wife. Again, information that there's no proof on. And he's using that angle to kind of insult Kendrick's character. Now, the reason why I think Kendrick has a big upper hand in this beef is not just about the amount of diss tracks he's dropped or the amount of hits that he's dropped in the process. But again, in my opinion, the clear winner is going to be whoever can dissect and assassinate the other's character in a more creative way. Drake attempts to assassinate Kendrick's character by saying things like, you know, you're out here begging for attention, say please, always rapping like you're about to get the slaves freed. You're just acting like an activist. It's make-believe. Don't even go back to your hood and plant no money trees. Like those are catchy bars, but they're very surface level. Like you can read those bars one time and understand what Drake is saying. All he's saying here is your whole career, you've been pretending to be about, you know, activism. You're rapping like you're about to get the slaves freed, like you're, you know, trying to help your people, but then you don't even go back to your own hood and plant money trees. Like you don't even go back and actually uplift your hood and get people out of their poor conditions that you keep rapping about. You're just kind of taking advantage of their struggles and their plight. Now it's a decent angle considering the fact that, you know, Kendrick is constantly rapping about how Drake is just an actor, right? He's just appropriating black culture. He is, you know, using these different artists to kind of help himself portray 
elevate himself as, you know, a mob boss or about someone that he's not. He's kind of flipping that on Kendrick and saying Kendrick does the same thing because he pretends to be an activist. He pretends to, you know, help people get out of poverty, but he's not even going back to his own hood to, you know, improve the living conditions there. Now, again, it's a good angle, but what's going to determine the winner is who can insult the other person in the most creative way possible. And Kendrick does exactly that at the end of his song, Not Like Us. On that third verse, he's literally giving you guys a history lesson on slavery in America. He's flipping that whole slavery thing that Drake was talking about, where he's saying that Kendrick raps like he's trying to get slaves free. And he says, once upon a time, all of us were in chains. Homie's still doubling down, calling us some slaves, saying that Drake is still calling them slaves. Ties back into the whole thing about how Drake is not really from the culture. And to make it even worse, he's referring to African-Americans as slaves. Then he says Atlanta was the Mecca, building railroads and trains. Bear with me for a second. Let me put y'all on game. And literally telling you guys like, okay, this is where a lot of slave trade, a lot of just slavery in general was happening. But then he flips it and says, fast forward in 2024, you got the same agenda. Basically saying in 2024, you're doing the same thing as these slave owners used to do. Then he goes on to literally name drop a bunch of Atlanta rappers who Drake has used in the past, or maybe not used, but has collaborated with in the past to build his street credit up, to get him played in clubs more, to give him more trap bangers. And again, I've said this in other videos, like I think Future helped Drake's career as much, if not more than Drake helped Future's career. By collaborating with guys like Future, it was able to give him an in into the trap music lane. Then he collaborated with Lil Baby and Young Thug and 2 Chains and Quavo, which gave him an even bigger in into that scene. And then he did a whole album with 21 Savage, which helped him get his street cred up. He dropped songs like Knife Talk, which were just all about murder, which he wasn't really doing before he started collaborating with these Atlanta guys. So these Atlanta rappers working with them gave Drake the ability to start talking about murder in the streets and incorporate a more trap sound into his music, which is ironic because the first producer that Drake started working with to try to tap more into that trap sound was Metro Boomin. And now, you know, Metro Boomin kind of started this whole back and forth and this whole war with Drake. So what Kendrick's basically saying here is, you know, you're calling me an actor because I act like I'm an activist. I act like I'm trying to improve the lives of poverty stricken African Americans living in the projects in America when really I'm not actually doing anything to change their lives. I'm just using it to get more critical acclaim and sell more albums. And I'm not actually going back to the hood to, you know, donate money or change lives. I'm just rapping about it. Kendrick flips that on Drake's head completely by saying, okay, you want to talk about slavery? Atlanta was the Mecca for slavery. That's where the most slave trade happened. That's where slaves built railroads and whatever. And you fast forward to right now and you're doing the same thing by using all of these rappers who came from that lifestyle, who came from that poverty, who came from the hood, and you're using them, you're standing by them, collaborating with them so that you can attach yourself to that sound and that persona and create more club hits and tap it into a whole new audience by basically painting yourself as this, you know, super villain as this mob boss in the culture with the sole purpose of trying to sell more records and he ends it off by saying you run to atlanta when you need a few dollars no you're not a colleague you're a colonizer so it's just a much more creative way of saying you can't say i'm using the plight of african americans to sell more records when you're literally running to atlanta to collaborate with these guys who came from that lifestyle who came from gang culture and you're using that to make yourself seem like a gang member to sell more records so again kendrick's just dissecting drake's character in a much more creative way and that's what kendrick's been doing this whole time he's been saying drake's a liar he's been saying Drake uses the culture for his own gain. He's been saying Drake's team uses him for his money and kind of pimps him out. And he's saying these things in a very creative way. And he's been doing that from the beginning when he dropped Euphoria. Now we'll break down Euphoria and I'll kind of show you how creative and calculated Kendrick's actually been in dissecting Drake's character. So I think a very interesting part about this whole thing is that Kendrick put together a song with like four different beat switches. Now this could be in reference to a similar tactic that Drake often uses on some of his biggest records in recent memory, where the beat constantly switches, he's constantly going through different flows, some beats he's singing, some beats he's rapping, like on a lot of recent hits, most notably First Person Shooter, Sicko Mode, Meltdown, but even as far back as Tuscan Leather, like Drake is definitely known for having those songs where the beat is constantly switching. And a lot of times they're big hits, right? First Person Shooter and Sickle Mode both went number one on the Billboard charts. So by Kendrick doing this, he's kind of also showing Drake, look, I can have a song with like seven different beat switches and it could go number one, just like yours did. But the only difference here is this song is just completely dedicated to barring you to death. So I thought that was impressive and it'll be even more hard hitting if this song does really last on the charts and, you know, peak at a high position and have that staying power as a hit because it's Kendrick showing like I can make a song pure bars for six minutes straight doing the beat switches like you do and it could be an even bigger hit than songs that you put out with beat switches. Now on the track the first thing we hear is the is the line everything they say about me is true I'm a phony but it's played in reverse. This line was said by Richard Pryor in The Wizard of Oz 
And what's interesting here is that Michael Jackson was also in that movie. He played the scarecrow in that movie. And this could be in reference to the ongoing back and forth they've had about Michael Jackson because Drake compares himself constantly to Michael Jackson. And Kendrick has come out and said, if you're Michael Jackson, I'm Prince and Prince outlived Michael Jackson, meaning like Kendrick has a longer legacy. And now he's kind of referencing the fact that, you know, Drake is a phony using the quote from a movie that Michael Jackson was in. So clever way to start off the track. The track was also titled Euphoria, which is the same name as a show that Drake executive produced. And the premise of the show is about teenagers. And if you guys didn't know, Drake has been tied up in a lot of weird rumors about interacting with minors and having some sort of back and forth with minors, allegedly. But Kendrick's kind of titling this track in reference to that. Now, the first part of this song, the first beat, Kendrick's addressing a lot of what Drake said on his diss track push-ups, where he's saying, fabricating stories on the family front, because you heard Mr. Morale. A pathetic master manipulator, I could smell the tales on you now. Now, Kendrick actually ends up predicting a lot of what comes later on in this beef, because not only was Drake referencing Kendrick's wife on push-ups, but he then proceeds to mention their marriage again on Family Matters, where he claims, obviously, that Kendrick's wife has a child with Kendrick's manager, and that Kendrick was abusive towards his wife. And he also mentions Kendrick's wife and Kendrick's past traumas again on The Heart Part 6, where he is literally referencing a song from Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. So it's kind of funny to me that Drake's dirty laundry is always just kind of aired out to the public. Like we found out about his kid. We found out about different relationships he's had. The only way that we ever get a glimpse into Kendrick's marriage or his family life or his personal life is when he talks about it through his music. And that's kind of what he's saying here is that, you know, Drake is basically manipulating narratives and creating these stories about Kendrick's family based off of lines that he heard in Kendrick's music. And he proceeds to call him obviously pathetic for doing so. And what's also crazy in hindsight is Kendrick probably had so many diss tracks already ready to send off. He probably had Meet the Grams ready. He had Not Like Us ready because he knew the angles Drake was going to take. He was predicting in advance that Drake would take Kendrick's lyrics in his music and fabricate these stories about his family, whether or not they're actually fabricated or if they're true, we still don't know. But he knew that Drake would take the angle of exposing issues in Kendrick's marriage. And he's warning Drake in this whole song, like to just keep this about rap. And if not, Kendrick would send it all the way. And Kendrick definitely had songs like Meet the Grams already planned and written and knew that, okay, Drake's going to take the family angle. So what I could do to step up the level of creativity in this entire back and forth is construct a song where I'm literally just writing letters or directly talking to each member of Drake's family. If he wants to take that family angle, I'm going to do the same thing, but package it in a way that's never been done in a hip hop battle before, where I'm directly talking to each of his family members. And yes, while he was fed some fake information about Drake having a daughter, whether that was from Drake or just from a different source, that song is still extremely hard hitting. The fact that he's coming at Drake's son, Drake's father, Drake's mother, and then Drake himself in the last verse, completely picking apart his character, literally painting him out to be a troubled, demented, depressed individual, and also dropping that 30 minutes after Drake put out his record where he's exposing Kendrick's quote-unquote family issues. That's just a crazy response. He's basically saying like, look, if you bring my family into this, I'm going to completely destroy your whole big release. I'm going to release another track 30 minutes later, and it's going to be just talking to each one of your family members. Could not have thought of a more creative chess move to play in that regard. Now, this was such a powerful record in hindsight. Like, we're going to go through this whole thing, but really what makes this record so special looking back on this entire week of diss tracks is the fact that Beyond just, you know, the multiple beat switches, beyond how hard hitting the flows, the beats, the bars really were. Essentially, this was a six minute warning shot to Drake. This was Kendrick saying, let's keep this strictly hip hop and I'm not going to expose anything about your family. I'm just going to criticize you as a man, as an artist, as a character. But I'm not going to go in on your family. I'm not going to go in on anything that the public doesn't know about. I'm not going to call you a PDF file. I'm not going to, you know, bring up any allegations against you. I'm just going to keep this strictly rap. And I hope you do the same because if you don't, Boy, do I have a lot to unleash on you. No diddy. But let's keep breaking down the bars in Euphoria. Kendrick keeps it going by saying, Tommy Hilfiger stood out, but FUBU never had been in your collection. Now, this is a clever reference because if you guys didn't know, in the early 2000s, the Tommy Hilfiger brand was very much embraced by the hip hop industry. A lot of rappers were wearing Tommy Hilfiger and it was rumored that he was actually racist. FUBU was a black owned clothing company. FUBU standing for, for us, by us. And what Kendrick's basically saying here is that Drake had never been part of us and us meaning the hip hop community. Now, this is one of the biggest 
themes or I guess disses that Kendrick aims at Drake in each and every track that he's released so far. And it's actually one of the only things that Drake hasn't directly responded to. He's responded to being a PDF file. He's responded to any allegations about him potentially having a daughter. He's touched on all the big bombs that Kendrick dropped, except this. And this bomb or this massive theme that Kendrick has mentioned consistently in every one of his diss tracks is that Drake uses and appropriates a lot of hip hop's culture. Over the years, he's kind of abandoned the identity that he had when he first first came in the game, which was being an actor, being someone who grew up in a middle class white background. And he's tried to adopt a tougher identity and has also collaborated with a lot of artists and kind of adopted their sound or incorporated it into his own. And Kendrick's basically summing it up by saying, you're not a colleague or you're not one of us. You're a colonizer. You take advantage and appropriate our culture that you're not from for your own benefit. Similarly to how Tommy Hilfiger allowed the hip hop community to embrace his clothing line when behind closed doors, he was secretly racist and basically had no respect for the very people who were making his brand popular. Then the beat switches basically and he starts doing these, you know, ad-libs where he's going like, shoo, shoo. And that's kind of creative because there's a lot of these little ad-libs and nuances in the track where Kendrick kind of goes back to imitating, you know, ad-libs that Drake has previously done on tracks. He also goes like, remember, like Drake did on Worst Behavior. And if you guys don't remember, Drake also did this on Push Ups where he imitated ad-libs that Kendrick had used on previous records as well. So Kendrick's kind of playing Drake's game here. And he starts it off by, you know, saying that the island he's on is remote, which is basically saying like, you know, he's the king, he's the only one at the top of the hip-hop food chain no one's there with him and he's also kind of saying you know the island's remote as in like his life is private like he's living remotely his private life is not exposed to the public like drake's is then he says got a benjamin and a jackson in my house like i'm joe and this could be in reference to his first verse on future and metro boom and song like that where kendrick again compared drake to michael jackson and compared himself to prince saying that prince outlived michael jackson meaning kendrick outlived drake's legacy so when he says got a benjamin and a jackson all in my house like i'm joe joe is the name of michael jackson's father he's got a jackson in his house like he's joe he's almost kind of saying like he's sunning drake and the benjamins and jacksons are the names of the people on the 120 dollar bills as well so it's kind of like a double entendre which it's funny this song is kind of full of double entendres and on drake's last diss track he was you know asking kendrick to come back with you know quadruple entendres that no one would understand basically poking fun at the fact that kendrick's not really making music that's digestible or that hits on a global scale but he's making more like complex rhyme schemes that you know take a little too long to decipher and kendrick's kind of owning that right like he's not compromising his style to you know make some sort of catchy club hit song here he's just going off on complex witty bars and honestly at the same time i mean this song slaps like i could easily see this song probably not the whole six minutes but i could see some of this song being played in the clubs you could bump this in the whip it passed the whip test 100 this could pass as a hit song and you could see that by the amount of streams that it's currently getting it's projected to hit either number one or number two on the billboard charts next week and it does contain all those you know quadruple entendres those complex bars that drake was kind of making fun of kendrick for having kendrick then proceeds to say i hate when a rapper talk about guns then somebody dies then they turn to nuns hop online like pray for my city he faking for likes and digital hugs now this is again in reference to the fact that Drake kind of suffers from an identity crisis and puts on a facade and takes advantage of hip-hop culture by portraying something that he's not to appeal to a larger audience. Like at one point early on in his career, he was always saying that he's not a gangster. He can't talk about, you know, killing people like his mentor Lil Wayne. You know, he didn't live that life. And even as early as 2019, he was appearing in awareness campaigns for gun violence and stuff like that. Like for a large part of his career, he always took that role as the non-aggressor, the guy who wasn't into violence. Later in his career, he often, you know, focuses on violent topics and kind of portrays himself as this mob boss. And what Kendrick's basically saying here is he just hates when guys like Drake, who weren't from the same upbringing as him or most rappers in the game, start portraying different identities or characters whenever it's convenient for them. Now, the strongest set of bars by far in this track is when Kendrick goes in and says, when I see you stand by sexy red, I believe you see two bad bitches. I believe you don't like women. It's real competition. You might pop ass with them. Now, what he's referring to here is a couple different things right obviously drake has been endorsing sexy red pretty heavily people are speculating that he might even own a percentage of the label that has signed her gamma is the name of the record label you can uh, look up joe budden's theories on drake having ownership in that record label which funny enough rick ross is also signed to and rick ross is also involved in this beef uh, but when it gets really interesting is where kendrick starts saying i believe you don't like women now this is literally the quadruple entendre that drake was asking for for multiple reasons obviously the first one when he says i believe you don't like 
black women. He's insinuating that Drake is homosexual, right? There's been a lot of pictures and videos depicting Drake as being quote unquote zesty, right? Drake is known for being a little bit zesty, especially lately, you know, painting his nails and, and kind of behaving weirdly on stream. You know, his whole I need a Max Win thing, like, or even in his music with 21 Savage, where he, you know, is asking 21 to do something for him. Like, he's just been a little zesty lately, okay? But yeah, basically, Kendrick is referring to Drake being a little zesty, insinuating that he doesn't like women, he might be homosexual, but this has a much deeper meaning. If you guys have not been keeping up with Drake's recent releases, a lot of the music on his recent projects, he's been taking a lot of sneak disses towards multiple different women. Uh, most notably, Megan The Stallion on his album with 21 Savage. He said, this girl lied about getting shots, but she's still a stallion, basically implying that Megan The Stallion lied about getting shot in the foot by Tory Lanez. He also dissed Ice Spice on that album saying that she's a 10 trying to rap it's good on mute he was going at serena williams and her husband and then on his most recent album for all the dogs he was going at asap rocky and rihanna and their relationship so kendrick's not only saying you know you're acting zesty or acting like a homosexual he's also saying you have some sort of weird animosity towards a lot of women in your life a lot of the relationships you've been in a lot of the you know prominent high net worth high value women that you've been around throughout your career you now are you know beefing with in your music and that takes us to the next bar where he says I, when he says they're real competition, right? So this is, again, in reference to obviously the fact that, you know, Kendrick is saying he's number one. Drake isn't even competition. Drake is competing with women like Sexy Red. Even deeper than that, Drake has been creating this narrative on his previous diss tracks, basically implying that Kendrick, you know, is doing verses for Taylor Swift and he's delaying his diss tracks because Taylor Swift dropped an album and he's scared to drop because Taylor Swift dropped. And it's just weird because Drake has openly admitted that he has avoided releasing his album on the same day as Taylor Swift so that she wouldn't rob him of that number one spot. So Kendrick's really emphasizing that here. He's saying, I don't think you like women. I think you view them as competition. He's like, I'm not your competition. I'm the number one rapper. We're not in the same league here. I'm number one. But you're viewing girls like Sexy Red or like Taylor Swift as your competition. You're trying to compete on that level. You're trying to be a pop star. So this one bar really has like four different meanings because not only is he saying Drake is acting zesty, not only is he saying that, you know, Drake is having these weird beefs with different, you know, ex-girlfriends or women in his life. And not only is he saying that Drake is, you know, a wannabe pop star like Sexy Red, he's also saying that, you know, women are his competition. Girls like Taylor Swift are his competition. He's throwing Drake's diss back in his face where Drake was dissing Kendrick for being scared of Taylor Swift. And he's saying, no, that's your competition. I'm on another level. We're not in the same league. You can go compete with Taylor Swift. So, you know, there's a lot of layers to this bar, which is what's really creative about it. And in my opinion, probably one of the strongest set of bars on the entire track. Now, all in all, again, this track was just such a great prelude for what was to come, right? Obviously, Kendrick had a lot of ammo planned and ready to go. Songs like Not Like Us or Meet the Grand or 616 in LA. These songs were probably created beforehand and him just kind of giving Drake that warning shot in this track telling him, hey, let's keep this centered on the bars. Keep this strictly about me and you. Let's not bring family members into this. Let's not bring dirt or gossip or anything like that. Let's just keep this straight hip hop. Uh, and he did exactly that on this track, right? Like big criticism at the beginning when this track first released was that Kendrick was recycling a lot of the insults or even bars that guys like Pusha T or Rick Ross used to diss Drake in the past, like talking about him being a bad father or being in a bad record label deal or being white, not being, I guess, having surgery, stuff like that. A lot of these insults were things that we've already heard before. And people at the time when it first came out thought it was kind of light, right? He didn't really go deep into the PDF file stuff. He didn't go into anything that scathing, but it was really just the, but the appeal of this song and what makes it such a great diss track, regardless of how scathing it was, how creative and engaging the flows, the depth of the bars, the double entendres, the flow changes, the beat changes, the different voices he's putting on. It was almost like a theatrical performance. And at its core, it's just six minutes of Kendrick breaking down Drake's character. Him as a rapper, him as a person, him as a father, him as a brand. Like every element of Drake's character is just being torn apart in this song. But he's doing it without name dropping Drake's baby mom or Drake's mother or Drake's father. That only comes after. He's warning Drake in this song, don't bring family into this. You don't want to do that. You don't want to poke the bear. And we obviously see what happened afterwards. But this just served as a great prelude for what was to come and really showed how unprepared Drake was because a lot of the bars in this track hinted at Kendrick having bombs to drop on Drake that he was holding back until Drake mentioned his family. He kept saying it continuously. Don't speak lies on me. Don't mention my family. Don't take it there because it could get extremely deep. 
And based on how confident Drake was once he put out Family Matters and just right away started bringing it into family-related issues and making the beef kind of center on that, it, it showed that he wasn't listening to anything Kendrick was saying in Euphoria and thought that Kendrick wasn't playing chess here and just didn't consider Kendrick a big enough threat. And we could see that by the initial diss tracks Drake dropped in this whole thing, right? Initially, Drake was just begging Kendrick to drop. He kept saying that Kendrick was scared to go up against him, that he was hiding out in his apartment in New York had nothing to say, had nothing to respond with, was frightened, whatever. Even when Euphoria initially dropped, everyone was like, Kendrick really seemed like he was kind of hesitating on this. He was going back and forth because one second he was dissing Drake and breaking down his character. The next second he was saying, don't go deep. Don't start mentioning family. People didn't really understand Kendrick's angle. And I think Drake did a good job at the beginning of shifting the public perception and narrative to be painted that Kendrick was not ready for this battle because he barely releases music these days. And maybe his pen wasn't sharp enough. He wasn't able to put out diss tracks at a quick enough pace. He didn't have enough ammo against Drake. Drake really kind of painted that narrative and was literally at one point begging Kendrick to start dropping stuff. And once he did, you could see how uncalculated Drake was because in his most recent diss track, he's literally saying like, I know you got another 10 songs ready to drop. Like basically saying, this is it for me. Like you can keep dropping your songs. Like I'm kind of done. And it just shows again that Drake really did not anticipate the magnitude or threat level that Kendrick was as an opponent in this entire battle, which is shocking to me because of how good of a chess player Drake usually is in situations like these and with his reputation in general. And knowing the output Kendrick's had in the past on projects and features and whatever the case is, you should know what you're going up against. And for that reason, I think he ignored a lot of the warning shots on Euphoria and did exactly what Kendrick asked him not to do. And for that reason, he's now in the predicament that he's in where you have millions of people chanting that he's a PDF file on a hit song. You have Kendrick dropping a diss song 30 minutes after Drake where he's talking to his entire family. And you got the entire world kind of looking at Drake as a culture vulture. And I think this is the worst his public perception has been in his entire career. Worse than the ghostwriters, worse than him having a kid. So I think there's three clear reasons why Kendrick's winning this beef. First, he's making songs that are not only scathing diss tracks, but you can be blasting these songs in your car, blasting these songs in the club, and they're still going to slap. He's making timeless music, and every time you hear those hit records, you're just going to hear straight Drake diss bars back to back. He's also playing Drake's game because he is saying, screw being on the clock, I'm just going to keep dropping records nonstop. I'm dropping four records straight. And eliminating any sort of talk about him being on the clock or him being scared to engage in this or not knowing what to say. He's saying, no, I have 30 minutes worth of diss tracks against Drake, bars nonstop. I'm just going to keep dropping. And the third reason on how he's really playing Drake's game is he's trolling Drake. Like, Drake is known to be a troll. Before Drake dropped the response to anything Kendrick said, he was putting out memes on Instagram, putting out captions, talking all over the internet. And Kendrick is just playing that exact same game, except he's doing it through the music. Every time Drake drops something, Kendrick is destroying his big release by releasing something right after it. He's also trolling Drake through the album covers by putting pictures of Drake's house on the album covers, titling his songs after TV shows that Drake is executive produced, titling his song a timestamp, which Drake is obviously notorious for doing. He's playing Drake's game better than Drake's playing it. Trolling him, dropping back to back, dropping hits. He's doing Drake better than Drake. And I think that everyone kind of counted Kendrick out. Because he took a long time in between his 2017 album, Damn, and Mr. Morale, where he didn't drop any music. And since Mr. Morale, he's kind of been quiet ever since then. He hasn't been rapping like this, this actively in years. And Drake probably thought, okay, this is going to be easy. He's coming back on this Metro Boomin album, Dissing Me. But he hasn't been active. He hasn't been rapping in ages. I'm going to outbar him. I'm going to put out songs that last longer than his. I'm going to put out more music than him. He's not going to be able to keep up. But Kendrick is showing you, which I've been saying from the beginning, he could just rap at a much higher level. It's so easy for him. And I think Drake underestimated how tough of a challenge this was going to be. Now, where I'll give Drake the credit in this whole thing, because his efforts can't go unlooked. Obviously, Kendrick has put out the better music. He's made the better moves in this whole thing. But Drake made some solid efforts, too. His diss tracks weren't terrible. And there's something to be said for his approach to this whole situation, where I think he may have the upper hand on Kendrick is the fact that he's framed this whole situation to look like he fed Kendrick a bunch of fake information about having a daughter, about being on Ozempic, all that stuff, which makes Kendrick look like he was, you know, thirsty for gossip, digging for some sort of dirt on Drake and didn't actually do his due diligence. And it makes Kendrick look bad because the entire time Kendrick's calling Drake a liar, right? Saying that he's manipulating narratives about Kendrick's family. But in reality, Kendrick stumbled upon false information and used it against Drake. Now, again, 
if it was actually Drake that fed Kendrick this information, then he definitely needs some credit for, you know, playing a solid game of chess in that regard in this whole battle. And I do think if we're judging it from the standpoint of, you know, who has more dirt on one another, it seems like everything Drake is accused of, he's coming out to address, which isn't necessarily a good thing. You don't want to be on the defense in a, in a battle. But Drake has been addressing any sort of allegation against him, has been proving that Kendrick's info is full of lies. And Kendrick hasn't been doing the same. Drake has been making allegations against Kendrick that Kendrick has yet to address, which honestly, at this point, because of all the lies and because of how kind of deep this has gotten and dark, I don't think it's even worth Kendrick's time or not even the right move necessarily to start addressing that stuff. Ride off the momentum of Not Like Us and the success that that's receiving and completely ignore the, you know, the shade room, the TMZ side of this whole beef where you're just trying to pick apart different elements of each other's private life. And with that being said, man, I think it's fair to declare Kendrick the clear winner in all of this. Drake's most recent track is just him trying to do damage control and deny any allegations that were made against him, which is not something you want to be doing in a beef. You want to be controlling the narrative. You want to be the one ahead and you want your opponent to be the one trying to clear up any sort of damaging info that you put out on their reputation. And it's crazy to see Drake in the spotlight, but I also think that, again, Drake is a chess player and he's been through battles before and knows how to kind of clear his name when he takes a so-called L. So I'm sure he's not done. He's dropped hints that, you know, there's a red button that he hasn't pressed yet. And he's put out some crazy allegations on Kendrick. So if he could prove any of those, then this whole thing might be turned around. But in the meantime, Kendrick has the number one song in the world right now. Kind of seems like he has the entire world dissing Drake anytime they sing along to that song. And really, at its core, he's the true winner because he played Drake's game better than Drake could ever play it or has ever played it. So I'll leave it at that. I'm curious what you guys think. Is Kendrick the clear winner here or am I missing something? It took me a long time to construct this entire video because I had like four different versions of it ready to drop. But every time I was about to drop it, Kendrick or Drake would drop a new diss track. So there was just more to talk about and my perspective would change with each release. So took almost a week to construct this whole thing. If you stayed around till the end, I appreciate you guys. Please smash that like button, subscribe, and stay tuned for more because I don't think this is the end of this and I'll be covering it every step along the way. So catch you guys in the next one.